Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Digital Access Show. I've been going back and looking at all the podcasts we've done. We've done 18. We've met some wonderful people and they've made some really good points. So in today's episode, I've decided to join as many good points as I could together. And do you know what? I only got up to episode six. So this week, we're going back and having a look at what Alan Parker, Paula Burgess, Adam Morris, Brendan Somerville, and Grace Cameron and Shannon Tail had to say about digital accessibility. I hope you enjoy the show. So, Narelle, what you're asking is, how do we communicate with somebody who's sighted and how do we communicate with somebody who isn't sighted? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And what differences or similarities are there? Mm. So I repeat back your question to you, and I put emphasis on the key nouns and verbs, so that that ensures that I've got similar pictures running in my brain to the pictures that you've got in yours, which raises the point. Another interesting point. If I can use you and Mark as the example, Mark's been blind since birth. Yes. You've you've become blind. Mm. So your brain has a richer storage of visual memories from your past that you've experienced. Mark yes. has a library of imagined pictures because his brain still makes pictures. He just doesn't have a, a connection between that part of the brain and the eye. Yeah. OK, yeah, So it's it's more important when I speak with Mark to notice what his nouns and verbs are. Than it is with you. OK, yeah. Um, the other the other the other thing is that the speed of which we communicate is an indication of which part of the brain's working. So if you were to be speaking at that speed, I'd actually speed up and go at that speed. Okay, but right yep. now, at this point in time, I've been copying your speed. Now, the the speed of which we speak tells me which part of the brain is actually gathering the information. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if I've got, if I'm speaking in my picture brain, I'm going, I'm, I just want to talk to you about the fact that I was actually going to go for a ride on the bike with Michael when we finished. Mm. And now I've got a picture running of cycling by the river. Yes. And the visual brain creates pictures really, really quickly. And is inclined to jump ahead to the part the future or to the past. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Whereas you've got a brain that's very vivid in its pictures, in its recall. That just isn't connected to your eye. But yeah, so, that's, it. that's it. Yes. So your visual memory is more strong now than it would have been in the past. And I hadn't thought of that, but when mm. you talked about cycling with Michael along the river, I suddenly had a picture in my mind of you and Michael on your pushies riding along the river. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Now, the fact that I go riding, we're going riding along, you know, on our bikes. Yeah. Riding on our bikes is going to stimulate a strong picture. Yes, it did, straight yeah. away. Straight away. Now, if I'd have said... We're actually going to go and do some exercise, which is what's called unspecified language. Yeah. You'd have no picture at all. Well, you'd have that's a question. True. You'd have a question in your mind about, I wonder what form of exercise. Yeah, and that's exactly or, what I thought. Yeah. Or alternately, you might not be interested in exercise and go, who cares? Now, <laughs> let me tell you what I think. Yeah. So, in the world of into the world of linguistics, if we can, if we can tune into the language that somebody's using, particularly if they're not sighted, it's going to make a substantial difference. Now, the other, if I'm just going to, want to make a leap, if I may. Yeah. If we would say that if you and Mark were my business partners, but you weren't blind, you were hearing impaired. Yes. Yeah. You'd be for those people who get to watch this as an auditory, as a visual 
video will notice that I use my hands very deliberately. Oh, so okay. if, I were, if I were talking to somebody who was auditory impaired, I began. So what we need to do is get a hold on this idea. And and we're going to have to walk through each step along the way. I, pre I am presuming you're making movements with your hands, are you? I, I am. Yes, I am. I'm Got I'm it. actually for the for the person who's sighted but can't hear. My hands are actually matching. Now I don't I don't sign. I don't yeah. understand. I don't do Auslan. Mm -hmm. But I'm very deliberate with my gestures. If I go and we need to we need to look forward into the future. Now you'll notice I'm putting my hands into the future to visually demonstrate to them we're going to the future. Okay. And we're making a picture of the future. Yep. But you'll notice that my head is still turning, it's facing you so that you can still lip read me. Oh my gosh. And it's because simple things. Because I'm aware that you can't hear, you'll notice how much clearer my diction is and how much more movement there is in my mouth. So that it makes it easier for them to lip root. Alan, these are really simple techniques. And especially with ADHD or I guess any of the spectrum, uh, there are different ways to communicate because the, the processing, uh, you know, the way the brain processes information is different. And me having trained as an ADHD coach, I understand that. So being able to communicate that with my team and then, you know, my team will come to me and go, oh, I don't really understand what that client wants. And like, let's work it back. Let's let's talk about what what their outcome needs to be and then work it back from there. So, you know, that's, that's I guess, what needs to change. I think a lot of people need to sort of understand that and know that, you know, neurodivergent or not everybody's brains process differently so i yeah. think it's just taking that step back and understanding that people think differently people do things differently and if they're not doing it or they're not understanding the way you're putting something across for you to take a step back yourself and go how do i rephrase that or if you do you know if it is in the neurodivergent space how do you um restructure that so you can make it uh, more understandable in what you're trying. So what you're saying is vision impaired people can be independent just with a few strategies and that's, techniques. That's right. And the only ones that are holding them back are those people that are not employing the strategies and techniques. That's right. That that's exactly that's exactly it because you know a lot of vision impaired people you know can help people you know, think outside the box and go that extra step to getting things working. It's just a matter of having people willing to take that extra little bit of time. Is there a time when you would ever say, don't put accessibility into a website? No. Why not? Like, like there may be a point where like, it's a give or take and yeah. being like, okay here is like some non-negotiables and here are things we can work but I'm no I like to make my websites as accessible as they can be and so even going as far as like delving into AAA where it makes sense yeah but yeah like we've talked about this before and you like you said this statistic to me like one in six Australians identify as disabled and so if you're not including accessibility then you're potentially leaving out like a market that could be purchasing from you like either a product or a service and so I just don't know why anyone would purposely not want to include it. What tips and tricks could you just say off the top of your head that are some simple tips that would just start them on the journey David you know what what would a person that looks at their website and thinks yeah I can 
you know, they're doing it themselves. What can you advise them to do to start on that journey? Uh, well, if they're doing it themselves, um, I would definitely be suggesting WordPress because um, yep. that will solve quite a lot of the issues out of the box, like I mentioned before. Yep. Um, choosing an appropriate theme, um, such as the Astra theme, that's mm -hmm. what we're currently using, that's uh, very accessible out of the box. And also um, uh, making sure that they use appropriate plugins that aren't going to affect the accessibility in any way, in a negative way. Yeah. Uh, and when building pages, um, they need to consider things like the contrast of colours. Mm -hmm. So they would need to uh, check that online to make sure the contrasts are correct uh, based on the, the, the guidelines. Um, think about fonts and uh, navigation um, in terms of making sure the navigation is clear as to where it leads you to. Um, and also thinking about images and making sure that um, there's alt text available for all of the images and that it's a clear description of what the image is actually about. Yeah. Is there any tip that you would suggest to employers to start doing before they even talk to you if they really want to do it? What, what could they do just to make their business a much more in, uh, attractive business to a person with disability? What what um, could they do? Sure, they could um, start doing things like doing a, an audit of their workplace mm -hmm. um, and engaging with somebody like yourself to look at their um, website um, and their digital uh, communication yep. um, streams. Mm -hmm. uh, they could also then start looking at how they um, communicate about disability in the workplace and be more um proactive in promoting um the way that they interact with customers through their marketing so um use images of your customers with disabilities um you know obviously with consent yeah. <laughs> um interacting with your business and promoting the fact that you know you do um you know service customers with disabilities in your business because i'm sure it, um most businesses do if not all um, because there are people out there who, um, unlike myself, have invisible disabilities and yeah. who don't identify um, as having a disability, even though, according to you know the definitions of disability, they they probably do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that would be a great starting point, um, and to also then start thinking about um, you know your recruitment practices. So using um, again inclusive language. Um, and then making sure you have welcoming statements on advertisements that says things like, you know, we welcome applications from uh, candidates with with disabilities, things like that. That's a really simple thing to do. I would never have thought of that one, but that's a, such a simple thing. Hmm. Grace, what would you say to any person with disability about, finding work or starting a business what's the one tip or idea that mm. you would say to help them break out of that isolation um the, there's two tips actually and they're not just for people with disability i think mm -hmm. these tips are for anyone the first one is to think of continuous improvement rather than perfectionism. So if you're looking for something that's perfect, it's really hard to start. But yeah. if you can just start on something small and know that you'll improve it over time, it's much easier to get started. Yeah. And the other one that I used in my business, my my business coach actually said it to me early on and it's been brilliant and when you have a piece of advice instead of thinking I can't do that because of this I can't do that because that requires me to go out of the house and go see people face to face I think I like I like the concept so how can I make that work for me and take out parts that parts of that concept and so an example is accountant meetings 
As mm. Often people suggest to bookkeepers, go knock on the doors of yeah. all of the accountants in your neighbourhood and introduce yourself and set yeah. up meetings with them. That doesn't work for me, but I can do it digitally. Yeah. So, yeah. 